Okay, I am here to uh, speak uh, purely to the military spending part of the fiscal cliff discussion. And I think the way to start that discussion uh, is to make sure that you are aware of the reality of U.S. military spending. 2012, $900 billion. You don't find a lot of different numbers for that, depending upon who has added what where. But I think that $900 billion is an, an accurate figure uh, if you include all the various pieces that you find in various parts of the U.S. budget. That is almost $3,000 per person per year. The AFSC has this fabulous illustrator, uh, which shows in the red that military spending is 59% of the discretionary spending of the United States government. Discretionary simply meaning uh, that the Congress has a decision over it. They don't have a decision over paying interest. They don't have a decision over Social Security. Those are not discretionary, but uh, they do have decisions to make about military spending. Another way to look at it is, how do we compare to the other countries? The second biggest military spending country is China, about 20% of what we spend. The third is Russia, about 10% of what we spend. And then there's that mighty, fearful Iran out there, which, uh, you know, spends something like 1% or less uh, compared to the United States. Uh, so just be assured that U.S. military spending is enormous, no matter how you choose to look at it. Now, in the fiscal cliff context, where the military spending comes in at this point is the Congress passed a Budget Control Act in 2011. Uh, you may remember that uh, they created this commission of 12 people, uh, six Republicans, six Democrats, who were going to try and agree on cutting this whatever. Uh, they were supposed to agree on that uh, by November of 2011. Uh, they didn't. So then the Act provided for what's called sequestration, uh, which is to commence on January 1 of 2013 as part of this fiscal cliff. Uh, the sequestration uh, demands $1.2 million in cuts over 10 years in discretionary spending, specifically stating 50% of the defense 50% of it not defense. And this is across the board, uh, you know, cutting across through everything, which is a, certainly a negative, negative feature. Uh, part of the $1.2 trillion in savings over the 10 years would be, you know, interest. We wouldn't have as much debt, so we wouldn't pay as much interest. So, you know, that takes away, you know, maybe $200 million of it. So you're left with a, with a trillion. Uh, you're dividing the trillion between defense and non-defense, half and half. So you're basically talking about $500 million in defense spending over 10 years. Uh, now, you may have heard uh, Senator McCain, and uh, I think and the senator from South Carolina, there were a couple of months ago, a few of them were traveling around, uh, you know, screaming bloody murder, uh, you know, saying things like $500 billion in cuts in defense, it's going to, you know, make us you know, insecure. It's a disaster. Uh, well, there are several problems with that statement. One, I've already said twice, it's over 10 years, not in one. Uh, and they, they left the impression with people by not saying it clearly and correctly that it's over 10 years. The other thing is that these are not cuts from the 2012 level, but they're cuts
from a projected growth in the spending at the rate of inflation. Uh, they are mandating that it will only grow like 1.5% from where it is, rather than at the rate of inflation. So, uh, you know, it's really not all as daunting as Senator McCain would like you to think. Um, the uh, next thing I'd like to speak to is where are the areas where we can easily cut? And my first comment, and I respond to the, to the witness uh, with whom I agree completely, uh, veterans' benefits is not it. We want to support those veterans and to give them what they deserve and to, uh, you know, to meet our obligations to veterans. Uh, that I believe in very much. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the politicians in Washington are all too happy to get on to the next war and spend more money on it and ignore the requirements of meeting the needs of the people from the past wars. Um, we can readily save a lot of money in various areas. Uh, several people have already mentioned the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, so I won't go into depth on that one. Uh, it was called a Joint Strike Fighter because it was supposed to serve the needs of three different branches of the military, I think the Army, Navy, and Marines. Of course, that didn't work. You know, they all have their separate version now. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are talking about uh, the expenditure of um, some $400 uh, billion dollars for 2,000 of these things, you know, by the year 2030. Um, another area that should be dear to our hearts here in Kansas City is nuclear weapons. Uh, we are projected to spend like $640 billion on nuclear weapons over the next 10 years. Uh, we can save significantly in that area. There has been a proposal from a senator, a Republican senator of Oklahoma to uh, reduce the, cut, the spending on nuclear weapons by $79 billion over 10 years. And then this year, a representative from Massachusetts, Ed Markey, proposed even deeper cuts of around $100 billion over 10 years uh, in a, a bill called the Smarter Approach to Nuclear Expenditure, same, uh, House Bill 3974. Uh, we in Kansas City are, are in, into this issue deeply because there is a plant here that has been built, uh, rebuilt, uh, down on Fox Road in Kansas City, Missouri, that uh, produces 85% of the non-nuclear components for, for nuclear weapons. So that is certainly an area uh, that uh, uh, can be cut without any damage whatsoever to national security of the United States. Uh, another reality is our 800 military bases across the world. It's, it's unbelievable. I mean, this is not defense, this is offense. Uh, we have still 50,000 military personnel in Germany, 36,000 in Japan, 29,000 in South Korea. You recognize all those places we had wars 50, 60 years ago? Uh, I mean, just the, the expenditure uh, on, on keeping these people there and these military bases in these far-flung 800 places. It's just, just enormous. Uh, a witness mentioned earlier drones. Uh, in terms of military spending, uh, the military will probably argue with you that the drones actually allow them to spend less. Uh, that's part of their way of looking at it. But of course, we know that uh, from a, a moral perspective, they're, they're abominable. So I certainly would agree with the witness. Uh, uh, on that. Um, the other point to make uh, in terms of talking about military spending is that uh, it has been shown in study after study that a billion dollars of U.S. spending on the military produces much fewer jobs than a billion dollars of spending almost anywhere else. In particular, a billion dollars spent in education would produce 26,700 jobs, whereas a billion dollars spent on the military produces only 11,200. And I think that should make sense to you intuitively, because when you're doing military spending, you have all that equipment, all that technical stuff. 
uh, you know, not just the wages that you're paying people. So, uh, you know, part of the discussion in the fiscal cliff is about, you know, potential job loss, and, and part of the discussion is about the battle between trying to keep people employed versus reducing the deficit. Uh, so, uh, in terms of military spending, uh, you know, the reduction of military spending, the movement of military spending to other areas uh, actually is a positive in terms of job uh, reduction.